Hi everyone, so I had a minor technical difficulty there with that first um, little video. So hopefully you'll see the video, a link to it in a comment, uh, in an announcement rather, for sure that has 15 minutes of just the multiple choice exam tips that I had done in class um, and expanded on them a little bit and demonstrated uh, for you a bit as well. Um, so uh, have a look at that video. Um, and know that so the uh, exam is 100 questions and you'll have two hours and 15 minutes and I will give you a breakdown of what percentage comes from where um, on the last class uh, the, the one on the 10th so one week ahead of the exam um, and so uh, I went ahead when I still wasn't feeling well enough to do this video, but recognizing that some people would want to use their Sunday uh, for studying, uh, posted all the material for weeks 13 and 14 um, on Blackboard yesterday. Note that the Potter and Hockenberry reading, even though it's listed as required in the schedule, I changed that and made it not required. You should be able to power through with what's on the slides, but I did leave it available to you in case and you'll see in the note in Blackboard, in case your future includes working in home care in any capacity, adult or pediatric, in case your future work includes working with kids um, in any capacity uh, in nursing, and in case um, in your level four politics and health systems course, um, you might want to write on the issues around health care availability and that kind of thing for your paper. If they still have a paper for that class, I'm sure they do because it's the issues class. Um, the paper, the presentation on health care availability and the stress and strains on caregivers, that um, chapter is an excellent place to get started. So it's still there. Um, also note that for your readings for that class, you only need to go to page um, 5 01 of the healthcare adaptation chapter in your regular textbook, regular, regularly scheduled textbook, uh, the leafer one, lifer, leafer. Um, so it's at the end of a section on medication um, administration and includes includes the section on parent teaching, which I think starts on page 500 and finishes on 501. So you don't have to read all of the stuff about medication, math, and all of that jazz at the end of that chapter. That's um, next year. That's level three. And there's a sign-up sheet on Blackboard for um, the maternity midterm review. So um, Megan's going to use the time in class to do hers. Uh, I don't think we can do uh, two reviews in one span of time um, efficiently. So I'm sticking with the um, sign up option. And so it's going to be Thursday, August 2nd in that break that you have between your health um, assessment lab and English class. Um, and so it's at three o'clock and uh, the deadline to sign up will be 2.30 on that same day. So I will make the the um, watch we'll call it the sign up sheet unavailable after 2:30, and I'm only bringing the exams that um, for people that have signed up. Um, so don't just show up. I won't even have your exam in the room. I'm only bringing the ones for the folks who sign up. And um, yeah, so that's that. Um, now, I've never, I have to admit, I've never used this sign-up sheet option on Blackboard before. So um, if it doesn't work, please let me know. Uh, whoever's the first couple people to watch this video, have a look on Blackboard and try that link. It's in an announcement right up on top. You probably got an email. In fact, I might have emails waiting for me uh, if it doesn't work when I'm done and have posted this video. So. Um, but my fingers crossed. The thing that makes me a bit leery is that when I turn off the sort of uh, professor view and go to the student view, I can see the group there and I click through and there doesn't seem to be anything that sort of suggests that it's signed you up or anything. So um, I'll let you know if I see your name but you can't or whatever. Anyway, we'll, we'll all figure it out together and it will be fine. I have a backup plan if for some reason it doesn't work, so stay tuned.
Okay. Um, all right, so adolescence, physiological changes. So their vital signs, uh, including their pulse rate, decreases and gets even closer to adult range. By um, older school age, they're pretty near to adult range. Now they're almost on top of it. They're almost the idealized vital signs, like they're going to have a lower heart rate because they've got a nice healthy heart, um, so that their normal resting heart rate can be even lower than an adult. Um, they're getting a really nice, good, um, efficient pump of the heart on each heartbeat that um, is perfusing things really, really nicely so their heart doesn't have to be as often to um, perfuse their their brain and their peripheral tissues. Um, they're not meeting, it's not meeting as much resistance from fat that's built up in arteries and the muscle itself is stronger. So that means that if they're asleep at the hospital, if they're on a monitor and they're asleep, you might see heart rates that are in the high 40s um, or the 50s, um, which would be sort of bradycardic um, in an adult, but on a 17 year old, um, answering my own question down here at the bottom of the slide, would I be concerned um, about a healthy teen who's in his, his or her pain as well controlled and they've got a tibia, a tibia fracture, this is shorthand here, this number sign is shorthand for fracture, uh, YO is shorthand for years old, um, would I be concerned? Not so much. Um, especially if I've been getting nice low heart rates for them when I've been counting their apical pulse for a full minute every four hours as I do their vital signs in the in hospital, which is the usual at the children's hospital um, for most kids unless they're there for rehab or they've been there long term for chemo. The ones who've been there for a really, really long time get bumped up to vital signs every eight hours, which might be what you're used to in adult land. But at CHEO, it's every four hours, if not uh, more often, which we'll talk about a little bit later uh, in this slide deck. Um, when kids have a head injury, uh, you're doing vitals much more often and in other conditions. But the example today here is going to be head injury in a bit. So promoting optimal growth and development, um, this huge amount of change that's going on for um, adolescents at this age, their leaps and bounds, gains in independence and their ability to think abstractly, um, the amount that they're expected to learn and do in school and at work and physical growth and emotional changes and social changes um, and hormonal changes, it's all it's gigantic. Um, and so it's defined as the beginning of onset of puberty and ending with full maturation at about 18 to 20 years. Now full maturation um, varies. Uh, girls tend to stop physically growing um, in height a little bit earlier uh, than guys, but um, that's of course an average. There's lots of women who um, have a history of having a growth spurt uh, in, at the end of high school and the beginning of university when they're 18, 19 years old. Um, so physical growth typically ends at 20 years. Brain growth and development, of course, continues on um, into early uh, young adulthood. Um, and so table 20-1 is going to be important for you as well. Uh, I don't remember what it's got on it specifically that makes it so awesome. But it's summary stuff to help you with critical thinking, start putting the pieces together. Um, so it's got a summary of the differences between comparing early, middle, and late so that you can start making links between that sort of older childhood into early adolescent and then how does that drastically change. Um, they're considering late adolescence here even up to 21 years. All right, so that's page 453 of your textbook. Um, and so as to reiterate, increase in growth, conjunction, conjunction with sexual maturation, uh, very adult looking, um, potentially not terribly adult acting always, and certainly with adolescents we can expect similar to um, school age and preschool 
and toddler and sometimes adults, a little bit of regression under stress in hospital. Um, people relying on coping skills that have worked for them in the past as a comfort thing um, when they're under stress. And so that's true of adolescents as well. Um, so up to a quarter of their total height is achieved in puberty. So imagine how tiring that is. Uh, so guess what? Their sleep requirements are huge and their food requirements are huge. So think about some of the teaching that then you might have to do. Sleep hygiene, nutrition. Um, and so this all occurs in a characteristic sequence of changes. Asynchrony refuse, refers to um, the maturation of different body parts at different rates. So giving teenagers that, so prepubescence kind of has that rounded chubby look um, in between growth spurts. Um, and then uh, teenage growth spurts tend to have uh, kids of both genders becoming long and gangly. Um, slimming out uh, and perhaps getting chubby again and having another growth spurt um, but that the limbs and the feet and the limbs tend to look a bit longer relative to some of the other body parts before they sort of fill out that notion of yeah getting sort of broader chested or filling out or um, for girls and young women in particular um, more fat deposits and and uh, changing body shapes that can sometimes um, require uh, nurses to reassure teens that this sort of gangly awkward period or this chubby period is really normal, it's their body being healthy uh, and preparing it for itself for growth uh, and development and having a full adult physique at the end of it all. So developmental stages of secondary sex characteristics as a result of those hormones of puberty. Um, so in boys, these are those tanner stages, which I didn't label this, but tanner is T-A-N-N-E-R, tanner stages. So um, this pre-pubertal pre -pubertal stage is uh, labeled in your uh, school age child slides from last week. Um, it's basically childhood, that's tanner stage one. Um, but the child themselves might be filling out um, and looking chubby at that age, um, getting ready for growth. Then this pubertal stage is, the, is Tanner stage two, and that's basically the onset of adolescence, which um, so growth of the sex organs, um, both externally uh, and internally, um, textural changes, their hair is starting to grow in a characteristic pattern. Again, remember, um, central to peripheral is the typical growth patterns that we can expect um, in childhood. And so that growth pattern of hair, notice, follows that same um, pattern of starting centrally and moving more peripherally. Um, and changes pretty much as expected on, as you can read in these little descriptions yourself, on to about stage uh, five. Um, in terms of breast development in girls, so the stage, this also starts stage two with breast buds um, and then further enlargement um, with changes in the contours um, and until you get full breast development. And growth from pubic hair for girls also uh, following a similar pattern to boys. What can't be seen in this um, diagram is also changes in the structures of the vulva, the external genitalia. So it's analogous to the males, the labia uh, and clitoris are enlarging um, and they have increased and in changing pigmentation um, along with uh, increased in sort of more textured skin. Um, and changes in the rugae in the vaginal canal as well. So rugae are like um, uh, sort of coarser ridges of skin. So in terms of promoting optimal health, these next few slides are going to go through these topics, STIs, immunization, nutrition, eating habits and behaviors, sleep and rest, exercise, and dental health. 
as a reflection, remember that very first lecture that I gave with you guys um, was that sort of general overview that touched on a bunch of these topics. So uh, again, reiterating that here for adolescents. So sexual behavior and sex education, um, this says opposite sex, but as we know it may be opposite or same sex, um, that teenagers are starting to socialize in a more romantic way, um, investing potentially in dating, although not necessarily. Some people wait quite happily until uh, college age um, to really begin dating, but their social activities might be more paired or more of a group dynamic that um, contains um, sort of dating and romantic um, things without formal dates like you might see in the movies. Um, so just be, don't be surprised about anything a teenager might tell you ever. <laughs> just um, go with it because they're going to be socializing in ways that are going to differ from what we th necessarily think of. Um, still going to succumb potentially to peer pressure, especially in the early ages, uh, early to middle adolescent years, peer pressure is a big deal, um, very peer oriented uh, in late adolescence and young adulthood. Uh, one of the characteristic traits is um, not necessarily framing your ideas based on your peers, taking your peers input, but not um, being pressured or influenced in the same way by that. Um, and I'm not sure why this person put sex education question mark. It's like sex education. Absolutely, keep going. Um, it can be challenging for adolescents. It needs to be age appropriate, as we've already discussed. So talking about coping still skills um, around dating and sexuality uh, and pregnancy, um, certainly talking about contraception, but also protection, so pregnancy contraception, but also protection for STIs, even if pregnancy is not a risk, um, and um, decision making and consent are continue to be huge. They should have, they hopefully have been started as a conversation earlier than adolescence. It shouldn't be the first time somebody's hearing the word consent, but you never know. Um, and uh, certainly talking about uh, homosexuality might be something that a child only encounters in the healthcare or school environment, might not be something that they hear in a positive way at home. Um, and um, experimentation in adolescence, both heterosexually and homosexually, is not a good predictor of adult sexual preferences. Um, and uh, in terms of um, sex education, there is huge evidence base to show that adolescents who obtain early sex education information, youth, uh, children and adolescents who obtain early sex education information from parents and well-informed adults do not have a higher rate of sexual activity. Um, also, just a note on uh, gay and lesbian teens, their sexual matur maturity may not um, progress in the same way as their peers uh, because of um, societal pressures and bullying, which we'll also talk a bit about bullying in a, some of the upcoming slides, um, but that may prevent them from going through some of the normal stages of dating and socializing and romantic involvement that other adolescents are going through. So um, if we think about our media in the Western world, constantly exposed to sexual sim symbolism and erotic stimulation uh, through media, and um, the things that people pick up from internet media peers, that kind of thing is often inaccurate. So factual information um, is important, imperative, um, and uh, some of the main issues around teen pregnancy is that the uh, teen parent or parents, depending on how all things work out, um, are still struggling to deal with their own developmental issues. Um, and, 
in terms of their own personal growth and nutritional intake um, and access to resources to help are huge issues. Okay. Oops. Why is my thing not advancing here? Okay, nutrition. So um, dietary uh, deficiencies are more common. Um, teens often get very passionate about things. There's lots of stuff going on around vegetarian diets and vegan diets, um, which are totally awesome and can be completely healthy uh, because you can get lots of protein from legumes, uh, which I'd like uh, chickpeas and beans and peas, uh, sorry, beans and uh, legumes, peas, and um, as well as like things like brown rice, and you can get all the amino acids, they're just not all in one complete little package like you would with meat. The only one that you are going to completely miss out on because it's only available in meat is vitamin B12, but it is in a lot of um, fortified cereals and milk products, milk-like products, so like soy milks and things like that are often fortified with vitamin B12 and you can also get it in a supplement, but teens might not know that. The other thing that sometimes happens with adolescents that are starting on a vegetarian diet is they become what is jokingly referred to as a carbitarian, so instead of, uh, they cut out the meats but they don't necessarily uh, increase the meat alternatives that are available to them um, or the vegetables and they start eating pretty much a diet of carbohydrates which puts them at a huge risk um, for nutri nutrient um, risk, uh, nutrient uh, deficiencies. Um, also sports take up a lot of uh, energy um, and so uh, kids need to be eating lots but lots of healthy things the tendency is to often um, get into that mindset while I've you know earned a bunch of junk food and then follow up um, a good day of games with a giant poutine or something when really uh, filling up on a lot of healthy food would be a lot better um, and also nutrition and school examinations um, in terms of healthy food for your brain, you need lots of energy, lots of protein, um, whether that comes from meat or nut butters and uh, beans and rice and things like that. Um, yeah, lots of protein, help you think. There we go. So common issues are eating disorders, Um, and but often commonly linked to self-concept and body image. Um, also sense of control, so that independence and having control are all wound up in a big mess together when it comes to eating disorders. Um, so there's awareness of appearance in general, this is not necessarily eating disorders, but there's awareness of appearance, um, comparing appearance with others, they're comparing themselves to other peers all the way through on all sorts of topics and appearance is no different. Um, they magnify defects or um, blemishes out of proportion. They often also tend to magnify skills out of proportion. Um, so if they do something well, they are like the most amazing at it, um, which is awesome. Just, you know, let you figure out the boundaries on that on your own. Um, and um, yeah, so and they're, as they mature, their self concept um, is based on uniqueness and individuality. So um, these are some general definitions about obesity and overweight, which you've probably heard in your health um, assessment course as well. Um, so in terms of nursing care, you're thinking about nutrition counseling, uh, behavioral therapy, like is food being used for other um, things like feeling, you know, dealing with feelings. Um, you're thinking about group involvement, like looking at peer groups that are, are um, available for like doing group work. 
um, family involvement, what's the family role in somebody's eating too much, uh, and what are the person's physical activities like. Um, anorexia, so this is an eating disorder where there's an inability to maintain normal body weight. It's typically due to um, not taking in enough calories, so not basically just not eating, um, or using means to make food go through you super fast, like using laxatives. Um, and it's primarily in adolescent and young uh, adult women, but that's not 100%. There's lots of uh, guys who also suffer from anorexia, lots of trans folks who are very focused on their body and making their body whole. Um, and um, in that trying to alter their body shape in other ways get fixed in on, on weight as well. Um, so it's really wide ranging, um, but most visible uh, in adolescent to young adult females. Um, there's severe weight loss, there can be severe uh, altered uh, metabolic activity. So is it life threatening? The answer is yes. It can lead to amenorrhea, which is no menstrual cycle. Um, it can lead to bradycardia, which is slow heart rate, as you know from health assessment. It can lead to decreased blood pressure, which makes sense. Your heart is being slower. You're getting fewer beats. It's also not beating as strongly. So your blood pressure, that pressure, that wave of blood moving around your body with each beat is not as strong. Um, so that blood isn't getting to where it, it needs to be. Um, you're going to be hypothermic. You're going to be losing your, um, your body temperature and you don't have the energy and capacity from your diet to bring that up. Um, and you're going to have cold intolerance. The circulation that you do have is not helping you maintain your temperature. Um, and a lot of electrolyte imbalance and metabolic imbalance that you have is, means that your body isn't able to respond um, in the normal fashion when it's stimulated to read as cold. Um, so you don't, not only do you not warm up, but then the, the cold that you do feel is incredibly uncomfortable and painful. Bulimia is an eating disorder characterized by uh, binge eating. It also includes laxative misuse and self-induced vomiting, uh, diure diuretic abuse, um, fasting, and uh, exercise regimens. Uh, bulimia and anorexia can be concurrent uh, in a person. They can, a person can alternate between the two. Um, and so the three major goals of uh, Therapeutic management are the reinstitution of normal nutrition um, or reversal of the severe malnutrition. Um, it includes resolution of the disturbed pattern of family interactions, because there are likely some, um, and individual psychotherapy to correct deficits and distortions in psychological functions. So if you are taking notes on what I just said, you might want to think three major goals return to normal, resolution, family interactions, um, and psychotherapy, personal distortions or personal functions. You might jot it down in a sort of shortened form that you're going to be more likely to remember. Or you might jot down exactly what I said and then condense it later in some study notes. Just a tip there. Uh, in terms of nursing care, it's going to for uh, advanced cases, it's going to include hospitalization. Certainly in a clinic setting, um, it might include ongoing assessment in a, in a family practice uh, as a nurse practitioner or in a physician's office um, with the potential of hospitalization. Uh, cardiac monitoring on those visits or in, in a, and in hospital. Um, and developing behavioral contracts to help people deal with that um, psychological uh, psychological changes that they're going to have to make to, to work through this issue in conjunction with this honestly this is it's not the nurse's role to be doing that psychotherapy therapy although there are nurses who can do therapy um, but it's typically social workers uh, and with working very closely with nutritionists dietetics so dietitians so in terms of rest and sleep, 
uh, adolescents require more sleep than before puberty. They tend, um, the growth spurts that they have require a lot of energy. They need up to nine hours of sleep, um, but far too few are getting that amount of sleep, um, largely due to screens, quite frankly. Um, and socializing, I mean keeping wacky hours, and so if your friends are texting you, you're going to be up and texting. Um, and uh, they, so they tend to have irregular sleep patterns, so staying up late and sleeping in late, and yeah. So there's the cycle, which quite frankly isn't limited to teens, but whatever. Uh, this can be useful information for young adults as well. In fact, carry all of these rest and sleep ones ahead to young adults as well. Sleep tips for adolescents and young adults. Naps during the day um, can help you work more efficiently. However, if your naps are too long or too close to bedtime, they can mess up your sleep. Keeping your room quiet and dark. Um, the hot tip for that is basically keeping your room for only sleep and only sex, that TVs, um, screens, all of that stuff don't need to be there. Uh, reading for a little bit sort of in another room or in an armchair and then moving into bed when you're finally ready to sleep and using the first 10 or 15 minutes of sleep to, to calm down if, and get settled um, and hopefully fall to sleep. Um, and typically when they talk about sleep hygiene, if you're not asleep within the first sort of half hour, 45 minutes to sort of get up and do a portion of your sleep routine over again and, and read for a little bit more and get a little more settled, use the washroom, have a drink of water, read a little more, and then start that routine over again and give it a shot and hopefully get off to sleep that way. Another big thing is also just dealing with anxiety. So if there's stuff turning over in your head and you're thinking about all the million things that you have to do or you just thought of something else you needed to look up or whatever, to keep a notepad by your bed and just jot that stuff down and then go back through some of your sleep routine again um, after you've made that list so that you can just brain dump and keep going. Oh, we've got some more tips here. Uh, avoiding caffeinated things and uh, caffeinated um, food and beverage, and also nicotine and alcohol interfere with sleep. Um, and also trying to avoid screens uh, and the telephone, socializing, also um, sports uh, really close to bed. They're going to ramp up your metabolism and give you an endorphin surge that's going to keep you awake. Um, a routine that's quiet or calm, so including bath, shower, reading a book. So the next slides are going to be differently ordered than what um, I had put up in the student ones. I switched things around because I noticed there was a bit of a weirdness. So personal care um, in terms of hygiene, dental health, um, and sun tanning. Um, so in terms of food choices, uh, even though it shows this guy with the, di the donuts and the chips and stuff, um, adolescents will shock you and will make the right good choices when they're offered. It's amazing. We had one young man who was in Chio with us for nearly a year after having um, a stroke and he was 16, I suppose. He had all his growth spurts while he was there with us. I mean, he came in at five foot two and he left there at six foot three, a uh, tall, skinny, skinny guy. Um, after he'd done all his rehabilitation after his stroke. And um, he had to learn how to eat again, so he was being fed um, with um, parenteral um, feedings and uh, so TPN, total parenteral nutri nutrition. And eventually he could tolerate formulas and he could tolerate, but then he learned how to swallow and stuff again, so he was on fluids and he was really excited because he could taste juices and all sorts of things again. And then he was allowed to have um, full fluids, which includes things like pulpy orange juice and stuff with chunks in it that if you haven't, if you've lost the ability to swallow, that gagging reflex can um, mean that you end up aspirating. But he could tolerate this stuff again. And so he chose for his first pureed meal off of the 
children's hospital menu, we thought for sure he was going to go for a pureed junk food of something, like what was a poutine milkshake going to look like, or a poutine smoothie rather. But he went for a salad smoothie. He wanted, he missed the crunch of vegetables, and he missed that flavor of vegetables. And so, honest to God, he picked the salad, but he wanted it pureed, and he drank it, and he was the happiest. He was just like, that is what my body was craving. So they'll make the right choices. Um, maybe just not as often because <laughs> they're impulsive and they want that one thing now. Um, and when it comes to like obesity or, or getting sick from eating too much crap, um, well, that won't happen to me. That will happen to the next person. I'm invincible. Uh, very typical thought pattern. Um, uh, and that same focus on self um, links to body image as well. So it might include taking risks like using sunscreens that are too low or not reapplying sunscreen well enough because they want a great golden tan and, and that type of stuff, which typically, frankly, a learned behavior that you get from other people in your peer group or your family as well. Um, but typically, they're more driven um, from that body image um, to more hygienic practices. Most will have a phase of not showering as often as everybody else would like, <laughs> everybody around them, because um, those hormone surges that they're getting make them a lot smellier than uh, the average sort of adult body odor. Um, typically, though, they'll spend inordinate amounts of time, time in the bathroom. Uh, it's a great place for privacy, especially if you have lots of siblings and a big family. So, um, and then also considering um, that their body modifications are part of teen um, insight uh, or teen behavior as well, including body piercings uh, in the older groups, um, tattooings, um, other modifications like the big labrette style earplugs uh, and that kind of thing. And dental health. Um, uh, it's the same as for everyone else, quite frankly. Um, sometimes it gets overlooked. That need for sleep overrides the uh, need for um, stopping in the washroom and brushing your teeth well or properly. Um, and again, that sort of, well, it won't happen to me, it'll happen to other people kind of mindset that keeps you from doing routine, mundane, boring stuff like brushing your teeth and flossing. Activity. activity. Uh, it's recommended that teens get one hour of physical activity every day of the week, uh, which differs from the young adult. It would be nice if young and middle-aged adults could get one hour of physical activity all days of the week, but the requirements for them are 30 minutes of physical activity um, three to four times a week, uh, or four to five times a week, and it's on a future slide here. Um, so adolescents enjoy activities such as skateboarding, uh, inline skating, etc. You can read that. They enjoy all sorts of activities, let's be real. Um, so uh, again, sticking with the theme through all of our talks, injury is the number one um, cause of preventable death in this age group as well. Um, it tends to be higher impact injury as they have more access uh, to motorized vehicles like motorcycles and off-road vehicles and um, cars and high-speed road bikes and etc cetera, etc cetera. Um, and I mean honestly the number of kids that we saw at CHEO with head injury and peripheral injuries and core body injuries and rehabilitation for motor vehicle um, or bike and vehicle related in accident was crazy. Um, it, uh, whether it was from ill-fitting helmets or not wearing a helmet, um, just all sorts of stuff. But um, motor vehicle uh, accidents, car, ATVs, so all-terrain vehicles, motorcycles, just huge at GEO. Um, and there's all-terrain vehicles and motorbikes for kids as young as five and six. So 
those all-terrain vehicles are very heavy, and if they land on them, I, they end up with broken pelvises and ribs. We had two little brothers who were, one was minorly injured, he was on the back of the bike, but the older one who was under the handlebars um, and gas, or some major structure of it, um, oh man, he was, he was a mess, he was with us for months. Uh, and he was just a little guy and he couldn't, and once the thing started rolling, there was no jumping away or doing any of the stuff that an older person might be able to do. So learning how to swim is an important safety prevention. Uh, why it's only showing up in adolescence, I'm not 100% sure, but that's okay. Practicing water safety is very important. There's a lot more uh, drinking around water when you're a teenager, so certainly in these motorized vehicle accidents includes boat safety. Um, so super important, um, scouting out safe diving locations, uh, certainly had two or three teenagers in my short four years at Chio who either dived into the wrong end of a swimming pool, dove rather into the wrong side of a swimming pool into the shallow end, um, or dove into a lake uh, and discovered either the ground or rocks. Um, firearm safety is part of that experimentation stuff, but using it safely, um, so taking the courses um, and having families keep those safe and using them under supervision. Sports injuries, so body contact sports, of course, are hazardous, and when you think about growth plates, some parents consider not starting their kids in contact sports till they're older. Um, after growth plate stuff, they don't have to worry about it. Um, but certainly protective gear is very, very important. Not buying your protective gear secondhand. Certainly helmets should never be bought secondhand because um, you don't know what impacts they've gone through ahead of time. Some helmets are only single impact, some are multiple impact. And then there's this thing called the female athlete triad. Um, so that involves potentially uh, eating disorder, so that excessive exercise and minimizing caloric intake, leading to amenorrhea. So remember that means no menstrual um, cycles. And osteoporosis is the big risk there. So they're doing impact, or they're doing sports which potentially have impact involved. Most sports do, except for you know swimming, it's kind of cycling. Um, so that osteoporosis can lead to easier fractures and injury, um, and poor outcomes in uh, middle age um, and older as their bones um, won't have laid down as much bone and they'll end up with weak bones in old age. Um, so yes, important to have certified coaches, use appropriate trainers, not just winging it in the basement. Uh, if you do have home trained at home, um, equipment, they should be used under supervision. Uh, people shouldn't be lifting alone and shouldn't be lifting weight um, that the other person can't lift for obvious safety reasons if you get pinned under any of your weights. Uh, head injury, so this is the leading cause of death in children, period, <laughs> but basically older than one year. So as soon as they start running around, on their own. So falls, motor vehicle injury, bike injuries. Um, primary head injuries occur at the time of trauma, so um, skull fracture, contusions, intracranial hematoma, diffuse injury. Contusions is fancy pants word for uh, bruising. This isn't talking about bruising on the skin, this is talking about bruising on the actual brain tissue itself. Um, so your assessment um, includes uh, your normal first aid assessment, circulation, airway, breathing, uh, and then whatever your level of first aid certification taught you. So when I inherited these slides, there was like three or four slides on what to do if somebody has received a head injury. And I had this huge ethical dilemma about, yes, this is really important. I left nursing school, like having learned none of this, but I did learn all of this um, myself doing ski patrol, which is a super intensive first aid program. And um, basically you don't learn anything to do with what, how to deal with an accident in nursing school. 
you need to do that in a first aid course. They're designed for that. Nursing school is to teach you what to do in a clinic, in a hospital. Um, so my dilemma, my ethical dilemma personally on giving first aid tips is then if you were to stop at an accident, whether it's a car accident or one of these other accidents, um, and feel that you were somehow capable because you learned in nursing school what <laughs> to do based on four or five slides, uh, that's not good enough. You need to learn it in a first aid setting where you're doing hands-on education. Um, so I took those slides out. But I highly, highly encourage uh, standard first aid as a minimum. Um, it will certainly help you as a nurse. You'll stop. You will stop. Be stopping at uh, car accidents or attending accidents uh, out and about in the city, like because you just happen to be there. And knowing what to do is uh, huge, rather than just winging it. It's such um, a relief to just have a set way to do things to just fall back on. It's really good and I strongly encourage it. So mild traumatic brain injury is a concussion. They're uh, the most common brain injury. They're transient and reversible. They are usually short term, seven to ten days. They can last longer but they're usually the, that amount of time. So they result from a trauma to the head but it's important to aware, be aware that that blow can be directly to the head um, or it can be um, to the body but involves uh, injury to the brain because the head is affected by that injury to the body. So uh, a really common example is falling off something high, like somebody walking on a wall, say, um, that maybe has, I don't know, a five or six foot drop and landing really hard on their bum. So if you can imagine somebody basically landing in an almost sitting up position, if they sort of slipped and fell off the wall landing really hard on their bum, their brain is going to get, when they have that impact, their brain is going to go smuck down into the base of their skull. Um, it's going to, it's floating around in that in that cerebral spinal fluid soup that it's in there and it's going to smack into the base of their skull. And so they're at risk of a concussion, uh, not necessarily from that direct impact, but from that impact to the rest of their body that causes their brain to be sort of shaken around inside the skull. Um, so there's uh, usually this is lo instantaneous loss of awareness. That's where that phrase seeing stars kind of comes from that you've sort of, you're not blacked out, you haven't necessarily passed out and certainly passing out doesn't have to happen for a concussion. People don't have to lose consciousness for something to have be classified as a concussion. But usually people have that moment of being stunned. Uh, maybe their vision is blacked out uh, depending on how their head was hit. Um, they might see stars. Um, they might be slow in their responses when you talk to them. Um, they might have a little bit of amnesia. They uh, might have confusion. Certainly, I remember somebody seeing somebody who'd had a head injury, and they kept they kept saying, "Man, like what happened?" And we'd be like, "Okay, you fell off your bike and you hit your head on the curb." Oh, oh yeah, okay, okay. Man, you guys are so helpful. Like what what happened? You fell off your bike and you hit your head on the curb. Like, do you hurt anywhere else? Or, you know, we're just waiting for an ambulance, blah, blah, blah. Oh, yeah, no, no, I'm good. Man, what happened? Like, it was just the whole time we were waiting for the ambulance. Like, yeah, what happened? Like, this happened. Um, so Rowan's Law is a sports law related to adolescence. It's in your folder. Have, please have a look at it. Um, you don't have to study it for the final, but it's very important to know of it um, because it applies to adults as well. Um, but it's around sports and going back to when you can go back to sports after a head injury and what adolescent and youth sports have to guarantee for their players on the field. And it's based on this high school student, Rowan, uh, whose last name I can't remember. Um, and she was a rugby player here in town who played um, concurrent rugby games with a head injury uh, and ended up passing away um, as a result. 
And so her family uh, advocated and for the legislation and it went through and it's Rowan's law. So contusion and laceration are um, terms used to describe um, bruising and tearing of the cerebral tissue, which is able to be seen on uh, imaging. And uh, so the signs and symptoms really vary. Uh, it's a vascular injury, so you're getting pressure changes in and around the brain, and you might have um, bleeds within the brain. So uh, it really depends on where those bleeds are and how, how much pressure is being exerted on what parts of, of the brain for what the symptoms are going to be. Um, and skull fractures in kids. So a great deal of force is required to produce. Um, Certainly when they're an infant, um, we had infants that were in the skull fracture from their parents having fallen down the stairs while they were carrying them. Um, yeah, uh, fractures on the underside of the skull um, can tear the brain tissue. I mean, fractures on any part of the skull can tear the brain tissue, but um, yeah. And complications, so these are looking um, at the different, the dura, so this D-U-R, oops, I can't highlight stuff because of course I'm on my pen mark. Oh yeah, so look at, oh now I've got a marker, oh this is dangerous, okay, I'm going to start marking everything up. Dura is the one layer of the brain and so epidural is above the dura layer, where's the dura, Oops. and subdural is below the dural layer, and I just lost my pen, there we go, this isn't great, anyway, I won't play too, too much with that, but if you have the dura layer, there's the dura, epi is above and sub is below, so you can have a hemorrhage on either side of that dural layer, and cerebral edema. Cerebral edema is t the swelling of the actual, here's your brain underneath, all wiggly and bumpy with all its little ridges, and that's actual swelling of the brain itself. And you have post-concussion syndromes, post-traumatic seizures, structural complications such as hydrocephalus. So again, if that basal, that fracture at the base of the brain means that the cerebral spinal fluid, which is normally going around your your brain and it goes up and down your spinal cord. If you have a fracture right in here, then that fluid can't move, circulate up and down and gets caught in around the brain but underneath the skull um, and causing hydrocephalus, which has some interesting treatments that we used at GEO, but anyway, I won't get into that because it's a long convoluted tangent. So the nursing care means frequent assessments. So kids on um, head injury watch would often come up to our unit having already had two hours of 15 minute vital signs in eMERGE, might have two more hours of 15 minute vital signs with us on the ward, and neuro checks, followed then by a graduated scheme where they go from 15 minute vital signs to half hour vital signs to uh, one hour vitals two hour vitals so that hopefully by the end of if they're there for a full shift by the end of the full shift uh, or if they were admitted rather at the beginning of a full shift then by the end they are um, on the regular four hour schedule but if they're having weird assessments then they're going to stay at whatever level they're having the weird assessments at so um, they might get stayed, their assessments might get stayed at the half hour mark for a while until people can figure out what, what's going on and if they need more imaging to check on what's going on with their injury. So frequent assessments, providing analgesia, um, sort of pain medication and sedation, they might need to be sedated to keep from, if they're combative, if they're having behavioral changes that's causing them to pull it, their um, at whatever we're treating them with, their IV and that kind of thing. If we've had to fully catheterize them and keep them from pulling at their Foley, which is the urine uh, drainage system. Um, if they're trying to climb out of bed um, and being combative, they might have to be sedated. Um, lots of charting, heaps and heaps of charting. Family support rehab, 
uh, rehabilitation and future prevention. So diagnostic evaluation, so taking a detailed history of what the impact was and um, what happened specifically. Um, this is, uh, so assessment for circulation airway breathing, which we talked about, evaluation for shock, which you learn about in the first aid course, assessing for spinal cord injuries, um, you learn about in a first aid course. Now in the hospital, of course, they're doing this through uh, imaging and they're doing it through the physical check. So if you end up working in the emergency room, um, you might be part of a team that does this on initial assessment of somebody when they come in to emerge. Uh, vital signs, so neuro exam and level of consciousness is LOC. And then special tests, the imaging, the, the CT scan, uh, MRI, uh, EEG is brain uh, waves, not as that goes to ECG or EKG, which are cardiac, and then lumbar puncture, um, which would only be used to be used for looking for blood in the cerebral spine, spinal fluid if you're worried about uh, injury in that regard. There's a note here, did I need to say that? Um, yeah, the initial period as well when kids are coming up and going through those huge number of vital signs, they're often nothing by mouth, so um, yeah, which is also frustrating. Um, but it's because they might be preoperative, they might have to go for surgery, lickety split if the pressure is too high. Um, certainly we had kids who'd been in, in car accidents and stuff that had had a bone flap removed, so they'd had um, a window made in their skull to relieve the pressure on their um, brain from either the swelling or from the bleeding uh, in the in the skull cavity. So serious problem health problems with behavioral components of tobacco, alcohol, uh, drug use, um, and bullying. So. Um, the root causes of these are argued over heaps and heaps. They're a great topic for a mental health paper or for some of your level three, level four papers in other areas. Um, most evidence-based practice says that over a lifetime, um, severe drug use is, uh, or severe drug use over the course of one's lifetime is highly linked to childhood trauma um, and so while education and stuff is awesome, um, uh, people use narcotic medications to deal with pain but I think it's becoming more and more obvious that people use it to deal with all types of pain including psychological pain um, as well. In terms of bullying, uh, most of the uh, evidence-based practice look, leans towards lack of development of resilience, um, and so that that bullying is a projection of one's own self inadequacy onto other people that, over whom you can exert power and control. Uh, it's not limited to adolescence. Bullying behavior continues on into the workforce. I think there's a statistic on it on one of our slides coming up. Um, milder forms of both drug use and bullying, especially in adolescent years, are heavily peer-oriented. So evidence base it shows that severe drug use over the course of one's life, um, so heavy, heavy drug users, uh, history of childhood trauma is gigantic in those populations. Um, bullying, um, not to say that everybody who's gone through childhood trauma is going to become uh, an injection drug user, um, but um, they're certainly at higher risk than somebody who hasn't been through uh, childhood trauma. And bullying, that projection of self inadequacy and then milder forms of both peer-oriented and, um, yeah. So tobacco use, um, so you can read those first three bullet points there. I'm gonna pick up the pace here a little bit, but that etiology, so set of causes, is um, linked 
great lead to imitation of adult behaviors, especially uh, parents, so parents who smoked in the person's younger years, even if they quit by the time the person had gone into adolescence, that adolescent is more likely to become a smoker, though not guaranteed. Peer pressure is huge with this one as well, often a desire to control weight, that self-image thing again. Um, um, people are less likely to smoke uh, in participation with high performance sports activities. Um, so being in an environment where it's highly frowned upon. Um, it's often related to other high risk activities, so I encourage you to look at that box at the top right corner of page 465 called the PACE uh, box, P-A-C-E, um, in terms of high risk activities including driving, um, behaviors, pot use, or relationships with family and school, so things that are flagged as risks. Oops. Uh, I think this is where I was. Yeah. Um, and that PACE guideline was sort of about the nursing care as well. Uh, drug use. Um, so this says the best weapon against drug use is education. I'd argue the best weapon is the prevention of childhood trauma and looking at social determinants of health um, in terms of people's coping. But yes, I mean education is important uh, in the adolescent population. Uh, they might be a little bit deaf to that because of that invincibility thing and needing to experiment and learn things for themselves. Um, hearing about other people's experiences uh, in terms of education or the risks long term down the road aren't necessarily effective um, teaching methods. Um, so that conformity and being accepted, peer pressure, um, and adoles adolescents are prone to mood swings, um, which the um, which drugs and alcohol can um, seem to ameliorate, uh, or seem to make better in the short term, not necessarily over the long term. Um, So bullying, uh, it's a big problem, not only in adolescence, it starts much earlier in school age kids and it continues on into the workforce um, and frankly continues on into long-term care. Um, so I don't care what part of nursing you end up working in, bullying is going to be something that you're going to end up dealing with. Um, so huge number, nearly 50% of Canadian parents report having a child victim of bullying. Um, whoops. Oh man, I don't know how I did that. Something with my touchpad, sorry about that. Um, so any participation in bullying increases suicidal, this should say ideation in youth. Um, on the internet, girls are more likely to be bullied than boys. Uh, rates of discrimination experienced among students who identify as LGBTQ is three times higher than in heterosexual youth. Um, so I'll let you read through a bunch of these stats. Here's the Canadian workforce uh, one. And so I point this out to you sort of repeatedly because nursing is a bit known for this. There's a phrase in nursing. Um, calls how, that nurses eat their young so that new people into the professions are more subject to bullying than um, people who've been around a lot longer, which um, is unfortunately still a bit of a thing. And so it makes for an excellent paper in your level four class on uh, looking at the experience, workplace experiences of nurses um, in terms of bullying and uh, they call it horizontal, horizontal, oh I can't think of it now off the top of my head. Um, but yeah, looking at those social dynamics in nursing. 
uh, and as well as in healthcare, um, it just takes different forms in terms of like in medicine where it's a real hierarchical uh, way with the, the med students and then the residents and then the staff doctors. Um, things kind of come downstream in a different way that the, more the horizontal violence is the phrase I was trying to think of, horizontal violence that you see with nurses whose um, profession is a little more equilateral than it, uh, or uh, yeah, um, has a little bit more equality to it than the medical hierarchy. So that bullying in the two professions look a bit different. Um, so in terms of adolescence again, traits of bullies typically, but not always, include advanced physical development. Um, and remember, this is physical bullies versus necessarily people online might be completely different. Um, suddenly, online gives you that power to project your own personal feelings of inadequacy in a different way. And it doesn't matter if you're physically large, if you've got the brain power to outwit somebody online, you can use that for a huge bullying advantage, which is really unfortunate. So anyway, the traits of uh, bullies in terms of schoolyard and high school environment include advanced physical development, aggressive, and typically parents that waffle between two types or parents that are of two types, either indifferent um, or permissive or who use physical punishment and are authoritative. Um, and then the traits of victims, they tend to be smaller, um, they tend to be potentially more anxious or insecure, or they might have a cautious personality, they might be more sensitive, they might have uh, lower self-esteem, um, they may have some obvious difference like a disability, they may have um, a way of acting or being in the world that doesn't match the gender that they were assigned, so whether they're more masculine but they're a girl or they're more feminine and they're a boy. Um, other things that might point out difference might be race, ethnicity, religion, dietary practices, all of those things. Um, might be things that would lead somebody to be more likely the victim of um, bullying. So here is a table that I will let you interpret. Oh, maybe I have a little extra help. That's great. Um, I would imagine those 12 to 15 shooting cases in the 90s is an American statistic. Um, but obviously, sorry, I just really quickly, uh, aggressive relationships later in life. So looking at that. Um, what that means for the future. And in terms of depression, uh, more likely to suffer depression, have suicidal ideation, changes in school performance, appearance, behavior can be warning signs of depression, um, but not necessarily. So kids need people who they can be confident, um, can talk to. Um, any threats of suicide must be taken seriously. Um, and in terms of, so my big plug today was for first aid courses. I also will hugely plug Safe Talk and Assist courses, which are both available through the Canadian Mental Health Association. But Safe Talk, more importantly, is also available through the Counseling Centre at Algonquin College. Um, so you can get a group of nursing students together, ask them to run a student, um, ask them to run a Safe Talk certification course. You can all walk out of your program with another certification to put on your resume um, that looks at suicide first aid. And then the assist course goes the next step. So this one's the first aid, and this is the how do we help you um, in a slightly longer term. This is how do I get you help right now, and this is how do I, how do I help you get yourself help uh, in the next 24 hours, basically. Uh, they're both excellent courses um, and look great on your resume no matter what age group or type of nursing you would like to do. And so through Counseling Centre for Safe Talk and through the Canadian Mental Health Association for the ASSIST course. Um, so lots more suicide stats. Um, 
couple important definitions in the middle here. Ideation, which I've used a couple times already, preoccupation with suicidal thoughts, remembering that suicidal thoughts can also just be thinking about death um, in terms of like if I had a funeral he would come kind of thing, which you know as a one-off thought isn't that big a deal but if the person's thinking on it and it's um, getting worse or like I wish I didn't have to you know go to school today I um, what would happen if I hurt myself or something happened to me you know that car you know drove onto the sidewalk and I was injured or killed and I wouldn't have to deal with whatever I have to deal with today those are not necessarily suicidal thoughts in terms of having a plan, but they're ideations, they're thinking on death and ruminating on death that are important warning signs if somebody tells you about that, that they need to go see their primary care provider or go to the counseling services and have a talk with somebody. Um, so it's the third leading cause of death in adolescence. And I think we've talked a bit about motivations there as well. There's a summary slide here as well. Affects thousands of uh, children. Technology makes bullying easier. It, in some ways, it makes it easier. In some ways, it makes it more available to people who wouldn't necessarily be bullies in the regular everyday face-to-face -face world. Um, but the outcomes are just as bad. Um, it also brings together people who might not meet face-to-face, -face, whether because of geography or because of age difference. So people, young people online can be talking to people much older than them who can manipulate them and bully them a lot easier. Um, bullying can also deeply affect children and their development in many ways, which we've just discussed, and increase in bullying awareness. And here are a bunch of different uh, options. So nursing approach. Open lines of communication, hugely important. Um, not being surprised when they tell you stuff. <laughs> so if they tell you something that seems shocking, take it on as if, yeah, yeah, that happens to people. That one of the phrases with youth that you should get used to saying is, you know, um, um, Sorry about that, I just needed a drink of water there. Um, so one of the phrases that you can get used to saying with teenagers a lot is things, something like, um, yeah, a lot of teenagers tell me they find school really overwhelming. Do you find school really overwhelming? Or a lot of teenagers tell me, you know, they have difficulty with their parents around um, opening up boundaries around curfew and that kind of thing. You know, are your parents being still being strict about cur cur curfew. So making that generalization that makes it the obvious that, you know, stuff that they tell you isn't going to be the first time you hear it. It isn't going to be shocking. Um, so that makes them feel at ease. Um, and providing for privacy. So unless somebody, unless the teenager is going to be at risk of harm or somebody else is going to be at risk of harm, um, you should be able to establish privacy with them on certain issues. So, and you you can always ask them, like, do you want me to put this in your chart? Um, what would you like, you know, if I said, you know, you can read stuff back to them. I, I noted um, that you said this, this, and this. Is that sort of sum up, is that accurate to what you're telling me you feel? So, um, people's charts belong to them, not to the hospital. So, um, you can provide for privacy um, for what kids, for what teenagers tell you, um, and do it respectfully. It doesn't mean you have to respectfully. Doesn't mean you have to treat them like adults. They're still adolescents. Um, they want to be like adults, but they need still boundaries um, and um, help in that respect. And so they don't necessarily. Um, need to be treated like adults, but um, so that hostility reaction might be due to fear of unknown, so that can be mitigated with letting letting them know what the established boundaries are. What are your limits of what you can help them with? Um, what is it that they don't know and that they need to know? Um, 
and rebellion is often related to grasping for independence and guiding parents concerning the need to listen, understand, and share, providing boundaries uh, that are reasonable, that allow for that independence. Um, so healthcare teaching from the nurse should include things like nutrition, dental care, personal care, body piercing care, accident prevention, substance abuse, uh, self-control, risk-taking behaviors, money and time management, use of open-ended questions for parents. So how do you, asking questions that aren't yes or no. All right, young adults. So people's growth is usually completed by the age of 20. So um, prime physical condition uh, is uh, most efficient at 25. I don't know what most efficient exactly means, but um, people are full of vim and vigor. Um, it's a period of life with typically fewer physical illness um, and well-coordinated and well-developed, at least as best that person is going to experience in their life. Um, it can often lead to more risk taking um, and uh, there can be weight changes uh, in terms of muscle mass, so gaining muscle mass, so where adolescents are long and lean and skinny potentially. Um, adults can tend to put on more muscle mass. Uh, women might tend to put on a bit more fat weight as well. Men are going to put on, get start to have their metabolism slow toward the end of um, the young adult phase. So young adult goes all the way up to the late 30s. Um, and that metabolism slows and so you start to, even though they might still take on as much uh, calories as they initially did in their early 20s, they might start putting on weight. So and it's that phase of pregnancy and lactation for women, fertility phase. So in terms of cognitive development, it's the formal operations stage. So thinking, it's still within formal operation stage, thinking abstractly and employing logic, but it, up, it's now the post-formal thought. So creativity, intuition, considering information related to other ideas. So making those links, making those jumps, um, generating new ideas, um, just really hugely using life experience, having enough life experience to actually use that experience to make connections um, and really start to think about the world in um, a really interlinked and really exciting kind of way. And um, lifestyle choices have been made regarding health. Um, I'd read that as like habits, habits have are being established and have been established so and it can make it really hard to break from them that adolescent and early young adult age is really important in terms of putting down good habits that carry on into middle age um, so career choice although that can fluctuate um, within within the young adult period as well and then psychosocial um, development so it's intimacy versus isolation, so making those connections. Um, it's still the genital stage, so sexual maturation, making connections as the Freud theory is the genital stage. Intimacy versus isolation is Erickson. Um, and so development tasks are around uh, making connections with other people, learning to live with a partner, um, whether it's you know successive partners, uh, monogamously or dating and having relationships with several people at the same time, typically starting families, typically rearing children, but none of those are necessary uh, in our society these days. Uh, it used to have a lot more social stigma, and that's what this point here connected with the social norms of age group uh, has to do with. A lot of these things were far more rigid when it, having Hearst rid wrote this um, back in 72, um, managing home, establishing career, um, and being connected to the greater community, finding a, a supportive friend group, 
um, these are still, it's just the weights and balances on these different things have changed um, in the intervening, you know, 45 years since 1972. So young adults, um, for a number of different factors, are um, still living or returning at home, um, which is a lot different than in previous generations. Um, a lot of cultural uh, reasons for that. Um, the real stagnation of the median income, basically, from um, the you know early 1980s till now, the median income has stayed exactly the same, but all of these other costs have gone up. Um, and so um, a lot of our societal norms uh, haven't really changed. Uh, maximizing your status in society, ma enhancing yourself in the job industry, getting settled in a career or maybe one career to another career. And this really varies based on circumstances and goals, etc. Um, but recent generations are more likely to stay single, not have kids, um, doing their own thing rather than following all those expected norms. Um, Same-sex couples uh, with marriage uh, it opened up a whole lot of people to recognizing that there's all sorts of going against the norm um, in terms of relationship. Um, that people were already practicing, quite frankly, before all of, before certainly before marriage. But anyway, regardless, um, and so in terms of not feeling uh, accepted, not having a social group, um, being different than nuclear um, or extended family, uh, young adults, you know, it's normal for teenagers to be recognizing these differences because they're comparing themselves to peers in young adult land comparing yourself to peers um, means that if if you're going against the norm you're not settled yet and it can be a different type of stress than the teen one of I can't figure out who I am now it's I know who I am but it's still I'm still settled so ending up with role ambiguity role confusion role conflict um, and also minority stress theory which is um, this theory that says that people are, are affected by the um, sort of daily uh, minor things that in society that point out, you know, that the differences and uh, inequalities to access um, that people who uh, are going against the norm in some way um, Feel. So minority stress theory also applies to race, economic status, um, language, education, um, yeah. So young adulthood in the Erickson stage, intimacy versus isolation. So that going against the norm back here, um, not accepted, not being in a social group, um, different than nuclear extended family. Um, sort of really heavy, sort of real grounded things that, um, and so the intimacy isn't just necessarily in terms of finding a single partner, but also finding a friend group and a social network and a work group that's collegial and, a, you know, having that grounded sort of foundation to then support bringing up your own kids and going through the rest of your adulthood um, and being successful. So um, forming close personal relationships and engaging in the community are the primary tasks. Um, and that own sense of identity that's developed in adolescence um, leads to that meaningful attachment. So if you have a good sense of yourself, you can create those connections with other people. Um, if not, then that's leads to isolation, not having meaningful attachments, not having that good sense of your own identity. And um, it, so that means that identity is considered one of the most important parts of young adulthood, not just adolescence. It's just an interesting little wrinkle to the theory. But all of the, basically all of Erickson's is building on each other. So it, it oh, one point that I wanted to make on here as well is that 
this is sort of the one that where things switch. So adolescent, all the way up to adolescence, I've been emphasizing through the course how it's increased independence all the way through increased independence. Here, the person is still independent. They have their own sense of self and their own identity, but now they're looking to connect with other people. So that independence, it isn't dependent necessarily, but they're connecting to other people. So you're less, their young adults are less focused on um, sort of thinking about themselves, less egocentric, and they're more involved with other people and meaningful attachments and connecting with other people. Um, so, thought I deleted this slide, so just put a giant X through it. I'm not sure if it relates to something specific in your text, but it didn't carry over well. And I don't, I know there's nothing on your, on your thing. Don't skip the part in the text if it relates to something specific in your text, but that doesn't make a whole lot of sense. So in terms of cycle social changes, now this is drawn from your text. Uh, my favorite thing about these next three, three slides is this setup. What a great way to potentially formulate study notes for your textbook. Imagine if you just had a sheet of paper for young adult that looked like this with like just a dozen boxes for all these topics and then you had one for adolescent and then you had one for school aged child and one for preschool. It kind of listed key top key things. What a great idea. So if this connects with you, that might be the way to go. might work for you. Um, uh, do, 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 do. So psychosocial changes. Um, certainly a lot more people doing post-secondary education in uh, Generation X, my generation, so people who are in their 40s now, but when they were young adults and when we were young adults, and people in your in the generation of most of the people in 5120 right now and certainly in generations younger than you that look like they're going to go to post-secondary education um, it's just huge uh, relative to back in the 80s 70s and 80s uh, the numbers of people that are going to post-secondary um, in terms of sexuality, choosing partners, evolving and changing, so that emotional stability um, with partners, people are still doing a lot of finding of themselves uh, through the young adult age, um, and so uh, that partnership stuff can change through that age. Uh, it's the peak age range as well for going through a divorce is between your t um, 30s and 40s, unfortunately. Um, singlehood, this person is asking, is it a choice? Um, I would say probably yes, but um, I'm not 100% sure what they were going there for there and they didn't leave me a note. Um, more people choosing not to have kids. So these are mostly just the choices that we were talking about um, on the previous uh, two slides ago. This slide. So health risks, this is this is where we're more getting into this, uh, getting into the nursing stuff. Um, so still continuing with the risky behavior, uh, that sense of identity thing means that you have a sense of your whole self, you're at your physical peak, um, you're uh, kind of just, at, you're earning money typically a, a lot more, you're a lot more independent. Um, it means there's a lot more risk-taking behavior, a lot more sense of invincibility. Um, people tend then to ignore physical symptoms that they might have. Um, so when they come into the clinic, uh, they might not, they might minimize physical symptoms that are actually concerning. Um, and uh, a lot of, well, I think this is referring, bingers is referring to binge drinking, um, that's that having money at least some of the time, so if you're using it to party and make connections with people that way. Um, and 
you might want to consider based on the quality of this section of the lecture, uh, using this template and using the textbook to go through a bit better. Um, and so routine health screening, this is the age where the stuff needs to start being done. So testicular self-exam and breast exam, certainly in adolescence, those changes are a good way to introduce those topics um, in the primary care clinic setting um, on how to's and what they are and um, letting people ask questions and learn about it. Um, and uh, what else is on here? They say exercise, no different than what you learned in health assessment, but um, I don't know what you learned in health assessment. So it's 30 minutes of exercise three to five times a week. It's moderate aerobic exercise like walking and swimming um, and cycling. So this is the time to build habits is when your body is at its peak. Your body is putting down the most muscle in the mid 20s. Um, and muscle equals bone mass because your muscles need to attach strongly to your bones and strong bone mass means strong bones into uh, old age so super necessary which are the following health risks that are more prevalent for a young male adult so I hope you're covering over those answers with your hand thinking to yourself what did we just learn about young male adults um, and what are the health risks going to be and why would they ask this question after all these kids ones where it's injury 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 but did i really learn anything different mm, no actually um, still risk-taking behaviors um, so a young male adult sadly now that we take our hand away and look um, if we look through the answers physical activity and accidental injury that it's pretty likely one. Environmental and occupational hazards, well if they're a young male adult they haven't been out in the workforce yet uh, or for a long enough period of time, although occupational hazards might be, but uh, more prevalent um, suggests maybe not, like that's going to affect a smaller part of the population. Coronary artery disease and diabetes, well that takes a lifetime to build up. Jen just figured, finished saying that 25 is like peak. Um, so peak physicality, so I would say probably I'd put an X beside that C. Um, and substance abuse and comorbidity, well that's true that that's going to affect young uh, male adults, but is it more prevalent? Which one's the best answer, A and D? I can pretty much cancel out B, oops. E and C based on that rationalization. Now I've gotten myself to, down to a 50-50 chance between A and D, uh, but I think because we noted health risks and there's young male adults are still risk takers and that invincibility oh, my pen stopped working. I'm going to go with A and you'd be right. Education is very important in terms, is the most important answering that question. Education is the most important in terms of um, acute care setting. Uh, people, base, young adults are basically coming in for accidents, substance abuse related issues, exposure to environmental hazards, stress related illnesses, respiratory infections, influenza, urinary tract infections, and conditions requiring minor surgery. Um, a bunch of those are preventable. Let's have a look. Which ones? Accidents tend to be preventable, at least in some respect or another. Substance abuse has the potential to be um, preventable. Um, certainly in more minor forms anyway, and in terms of education to prevent future substance abuse, education is super important. Exposure to environmental uh, hazards, depending on what they are, education might be influenced there. Stress-related illnesses, so education about stressors uh, can prevent that respiratory infection. And influenza, hand washing education, nurses are hugely involved with that urinary tract infections, 
uh, hand washing again, um, as well as some other basic hygiene stuff, uh, like for women, wiping front to back, not back to front. You'd be surprised what you're going to see in healthcare, <laughs> people just not knowing that. Um, and then conditions requiring minor surgery. So uh, the bulk of that list um, has some sort of health promotion, education, prevention aspect to it. Um, all of these topics involve restorative and continuing care. Many of them are sort of later young adult and middle life. Um, this should say sense of identity, so relating those to sense of identity, establishment of independence, reorganization of relationships for young adults uh, in terms of chronic care. Um, yeah. It's not the best slide. I wouldn't worry too much. In fact, you can write, don't worry about this slide next to this slide. Any questions, you can certainly email me at c-a-r-r-o-l-j at algonquincollege.com.